services, which is my basic thing. And also, you have to pay extreme heed to the job. If you're not, then you can just write down any sort of hyperbolic equation, and you're not going to make any problems. There has to be an underlying geometry if you want to attack any nonlinear problems and get any results. So I hope that the equations I'm going to describe, there are many, many open questions there, which I don't know at this point how to proceed further, and I hope it will encourage some of the other people to, to uh, proceed and try to see whether they can address this question. Okay. So uh, uh, this is a, the work I'm going to describe is a joint work with Polan Jung, who was uh, actually uh, my postdoc and whose name we have already seen in, in connection with the Posky mass theorem. And so uh, when he came to Rutgers, uh, he did not uh, have any experience in hyperbolic equations, neither did I. So we just said, okay, let's pick up a problem, a topic on which we knew nothing about. And through learning, uh, uh, through working on these problems, we are going to learn, learn a subject. So this is how this program works. So there are two types of equations I want to focus on. And uh, <coughs> the first type, first equation I want to focus on is uh, this equation, minus uh, uh, vp square u plus Laplace in u equals 2ux by uy. And u is a function from uh, t is the time and from r2 to r3. So if you remove this part, this is the constant mean curvature equation. Okay. So this is a conformally invariant system. And it is exactly, it has the same sort of uh, phenomena that is associated with the Yamame problem. And I will explain this more. The second equation you already have seen, this is the, if you remove this, this is the Gauss curvature type equation on the two sphere. Now I'm trying to understand the hyperbolic Yamame problem. So there is a, there is a lot of issues here uh, that, that, <coughs> that, that, that really uh, make the problem a little complicated simply because you see the geodesics on the sphere come, come go around and around. So there are hardly any dispersing effects. So if you want to understand hyperbolic problems, it's always nice to be on manifolds where there is dispersion. Unfortunately, on the sphere, on S2 in particular, there is no dispersion. So these things make the problem difficult. And here the nonlinearity is, 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 is there is a <coughs> cancellation here. And you are going to see that this is related to what are called null forms that were introduced for uh, various equations like uh, 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 klein lord and so on by Kleinerman, Marketon, and things like that. So the null form, the peculiar structure of this is very fundamental. And these null forms also appear in what are called the theory of Bayes maps. So this, is, this, this, this sort of behavior here is actually worse than the one that appears in the so-called wave map theory of Shatta and Kleinerman. And I will explain this more in the second. So this, these two equations would be the focus of, of my first lecture, which is sort of trying to tell you what Polam and I have done. And in the second lecture, I shall tell you a little bit more about the ideas and some, some, some computations. Uh, for each fixed time slice, is there still some conformal invariance? <coughs> yes, so there is, this, there is the cr crucial space in which you describe your initial data is H1. But unfortunately, we are not yet down to that crucial space. I mean, to get to get started, we need to know to get the global theory. We need to know you have local existence in H one. We are not yet there. That already this uh, this thing already there is a huge amount of difficulty that we have to overcome. And this uh, I want. And the question last is actually I mentioned each fixed t is uh, this an equation has a fixed time t. Is there some conformal invariance? Yes, there is all the scaling, the dilation, all of this is, is true there. That's why, the because of that reason, the crucial space is H1. That, that the conformal invariance pushes you into the crucial H1 space for uh, existence. That is the space in which you have to do existence, otherwise there is no global theory. That's the end of the okay. So to get down to the, that, I mean, is, is, we haven't yet achieved that, and I want to also point this out. All right. So uh, here, uh, here, let me just tell you exactly what, what, what is. So this is the elliptic part, and if you look at, if you impose on you these two these two conditions, which are called plateau conditions, 
then this U will, its image will describe for you a surface with mean curvature one, also a mean curvature. That is why, uh, so really speaking, if you just have this equation without this, then it is not quite the CMC equation, but anyhow, already the difficulties are, are tremendous in analyzing this one. And so this is even left to the okay. so This one we do not have to say much. I mean, Alice has already spoken uh, a lot about this, this equation. This, as you very well know, is the one for constant uh, Gaussian curvature. And so this is Liouville's equation, for example, and, and, and you have already seen a lot about it. So it will turn out that many of the tech tools that uh, Alice has described in her talk, even though they are elliptic tools, will also be applicable to the hyperbolic situation. In particular, the moser pudinger inequality will play a significant role. Now, you see, there is another difficulty with these problems. And the difficulty is that we are in low dimension. We are in dimension two. So when you are in dimension two, there are these very important inequalities for wave equations known as Trichard's inequality. These are not available for you in these low dimensions. So the only thing that is available for you are energy inequalities. If you only go to dimension four and higher, then the Strickhardt's inequalities become available. <coughs> in these low dimensions, you do not have Strickhardt's inequalities. So that makes these problems even more harder because you just have to play with energy inequalities and also you have to choose the correct space in which to describe the situations. Okay, so let me keep going with the static case. And here you're going to see the conformal nature of this equation. So if you, if you look at this static equation, then you see this is, a, this is an H1 critical equation. Okay, it, it scales the right way and so on. Because if U is a solution, dilation of U is also a solution preserving the H1 norm because we are in 2D. The dilations uh, play a role. And, the, and just like you have bubbling for the Gauss equation, which was the formula was written down by Alice, you also have bubbling here. So the bubbles are completely classified, and it's a very beautiful result of my colleague uh, Ayn Regis and, and Jamishal Koho. So the bubbles are that, what do I mean by bubbles? That is, if you take an equation in this, this form, with, so u is a map from uh, r2 to r3. It's not a scalar. And you assume that this is finite. Then it turns out the energy, this energy is quantized. It cannot take on any value. This value, this value is some, some integral value, a pi k. And what is this u? So the u's are exactly, you take, <coughs> you take a rational function on, 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 on the complex plane, and you take the inverse stereographic projection from the complex plane into the Riemann sphere. So if you take the inverse stereographic projection, then the u's are exactly that. And it turns out that the k that I'm writing down is 8 pi, the maximum of the degree of PLQ. So there is, a, there is a quantization going on here. So the simplest bubble is if P of z is z and Q of z is 1. So that is means, you see, that means y. So it's constant mean curvature, right? It is the Riemann sphere. So it is exactly the one that sort of 2x over 1 plus r squared, 2y over 1 plus r squared. And then 1 minus r squared, 1 plus r squared, or the other way around, where r squared is equal to x squared. So this is the basic bubble of degree 1. Okay? So this is the basic bubble that you get for this problem of degree 1. So you have a concentration phenomenon. And then this was uh, also uh, the, the concentration of, of, uh, of these bubbles and so on in this elliptic problem was, uh, was uh, investigated by Prejis and Cohen. Paper which is entitled How to Blow Bubbles. Because these are really bubbles. They are really Riemann sphere of radius one. And when you go into the higher degree, the image is still a Riemann, is still the sphere of radius one, except there is a very high winding number. So this k is to be thought of as some winding numbers. Okay. Alright, so so uh, so in other words. So this is exactly what is said here, is that this is like a ground state, and so on. Now, associated to this equation, there is a Sobolev inequality. And this is the Sobolev inequality. So the Sobolev inequality, which is, as you have seen, there is a Sobolev inequality <coughs> of, 
or for the Yamabe problem, there is a, some sort of a Moser Schrodinger for the, for the Gauss curvature problem. Associated to this, there is a certain sober level inequality, which is so this is some sort of a volume, and this is uh, bounded by this term. And the extremals of this thing, this inequality, the extremals of this inequality, exactly the bounds. So uh, this, uh, these inequalities go back to Vente, and uh, there's work of Regis Cohen. So this is the Vente's inequality. And there is uh, uh, the main point is that there is uh, some sort of cancellation going on here. And this cancellation is, uh, gives rise to the phenomena of compensated compactness. So the phenomena of compensated compactness is also linked to what is known as the Hardy's phases. And then there, is, there are versions of compensated compactness due to Yan Yan Li and myself and so on in very general situations which I talked about in the workshop in, in July in some of you attended. Okay? Yeah. All right, so, so here I'm again uh, saying what I just uh, said before. This is just a reiteration that the bubble of degree one is exactly this one, which is just the uh, Riemann, uh, which is the first Riemann <laughs> Uh, which is this inverse geographic projection, and this is exactly what you get when you take P of Z equals Z and Q of Z equals Z. All right, so, so, now, so now associated to this, there is a conserved quantity. The wave equation, there is a conserved quantity, and this is the conserved quantity. So this is preserved along the, along the wave equation. And so now, uh, here, if you are, so in other words, you have, uh, you have initial data. So the, this is uh, the UT. So maybe I was not clear with it, what this, this means. So here, what I'm saying is that this what in the way notation is that you have minus U to T plus the plus in U, 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 X, U, Y, and then U of X is zero. I'm calling it as U0. So that is not, these are the U2s and U1s. And essentially what we are seeing here is that, that this is the energy at time zero. And so this energy is the one that remains true for all of Okay, so so you see here that there is this piece here. And you see that this piece is essentially the part that uh, you saw in the sober level inequality. So the Sobolev inequality term, the Vente's inequality, whichever, or the Bonuncini inequality, whichever you consider, is, is a part of this conserved quantity. So, so now there are, so now there are two, so the first, the first result that we have is that there is, that you have to be very careful. Because you see as energy, so, so if, since energy is conserved, if you give enough energy, for the bubble to form, which is, you, you saw there that the energy of the first bubble is 8 pi. So if you start essentially with energy more than 8 pi, since energy is conserved, there is a chance that the bubble will form because there is conservation of energy along the flow. So if energy, if there is enough energy to begin with and so that you can allow the <coughs> bubble to form, that means the solution can pre presumably concentrate and blow up in finite time. There is a chance. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. So, so, so here, so here you have uh, the solution. So you see here that it's not just giving a giving a solution, uh, giving some initial data and doing something, and then you will get a global in time solution. Now you have to pay attention to the bubbling and concentration phenomena. So, in other words, if if you have enough energy there to start with, so if you have enough energy which is more than the energy of the bubble, W is the energy of the bubble, and then this is some condition that I'm going to illustrate by a graph later in the next slide, then you're going to have a problem that is the L2 norm of U2 will blow up in finite time, it become infinite. So in other words, if you would like to prove a global existence theorem, you better stay below 8 pi in energy. Do not give up enough energy for at least to have public. So, okay. Now, there is an analog of such a result for the Yamabe equation. This is a scalar equation. This, this is, a, remember, this is a system. This is not a scalar equation because u is valued from 
R in from R2 cross R into R3. So it has three components. So it's a nice model if you want if you want to think about it. This is a, also a very nice model for some of these young mills or any of these equations because these also are systems. So in, in this context, there is also a, a, a blow up phenomena which is uh, proved by uh, Kenny and Nern in their ACTA paper. It is somewhat similar to this. That is, if you are above the energy of the first bubble, which is uh, something like what uh, Paul wrote down in his talk, but for the CR problem, but you have the same same sort of 1 over 1 plus mod x squared, uh, the Green's function smoothed out. If you are more than the energy of that, then you will also have a similar type of blow up, blow up situation. But in their case, uh, the situation for local existence is not that complicated, since they are in dimension three and higher, and you have strict cuts estimates, so you can you can at least understand very well exactly uh, below this energy level and so on, and then go on to the global existence and so on. This can all be done. Unfortunately for us, we don't have this uh, all of this in our hand because we are in dimension two. And again, you are seeing the role of the conformal invariance taking to the youth, uh, coming into play here by this uh, energy concentration and the bubbling effects. So there is not only all of that, but all the difficulties of harmonic analysis and so on, which are there, the geometry in the case of the sphere, which uh, really makes life harder for you, uh, which is associated with very non-dispersive non uh, phenomena. Okay, so, uh, so let, let's try to give you some understanding of how this blow-up theorem is. <coughs> So, that, so, so you have actually, uh, you see here that you have this object, right? This is the, the energy for the static solution, and you have this. So what I, one does is that it's nice to focus on this quantity. And another way of, of, of writing this, this, this stuff is to, to look at f of mod drag u square and putting, putting all of this together, this and this and this, you can see that the f computed at this must be less than E of this. This is just putting these three facts together, right? So, so then it turns out, so then it turns out that you can view this F function as this graph. Okay, so it's very important to see the nature of this graph because this graph does not occur for the Gauss curvature equation, unfortunately. If this sort of graph appeared for the Gauss curvature equation, which I'm yet to talk about, then things would, would be very nice. Unfortunately, you don't have this sort of graph because there is a very famous inequality due to on off rate, which basically says that you can never go below the axis. But here we have this thing. So the on off rate inequality, which is like Alice's lecture, you have a lower bound minus constant. On off rate, on off rate improved, Moses bound to say it's bigger equal to zero. So it's a very fundamental result for now. So uh, this will also be very bad for the Gauss equation, but for this equation, at least we have this. So the, the previous inequality, which I wrote down, this one now can be uh, reinterpreted that uh, this, this point, this point always lies above the graph of F because F computed at this value will be less than equal to zero. Now, what was our condition? Well, our condition was, if you go back, okay, this condition, this condition, basically said that you are here. The drag U0 was bigger than mod drag U0. And what did energy conservation say? Well, energy conservation said that you will always remain, you will always remain, uh, remember, you also had this condition. You also had this condition. So this energy, the energy is always less than that. So this energy is preserved along the hypo, uh, along the along the <coughs> along the flow. So for all further time, this will always be less than that. So going back to the graph, you are here. The F value is always going to be less than this value. So that means if you start from here for any further time, you are never going to cross this number. You will always stay to the right. Well, that's what that's what happened. Okay, so that is what I'm saying. So if you since you have this, and you have this, so by conservation of energy you have uh, this result. 
So therefore, by if you are things are moving continuously, you don't have like a sudden jump. If you are to the right, you are always satisfying this condition. You will always have this property in the future. <coughs> So now we want to prove that t, the, the, the existence, must be finite. So what do you do? <coughs> well, you take this object here, and you differentiate, <coughs> and you play around with the second derivative, and then you do some, some computations, and then you end up with some object like this. And the punch line is in the next slide, but anyhow, you, the, the, there is some computations to be done. And when you do this computation, you, uh, you arrive finally at this sort of point. But I just said that the integral of mod grad u square dominates, it's to the right of mod grad w square. This is, a, this is a conclusion. Therefore, we can drop this here. So therefore, we end up getting that, uh, uh, so you, you end up getting that y second. You see y second, if I essentially drop this, then y second will be more than 5 of this conclusion. Because I can just drop this, and then uh, then there is a some sort of little computation that you do, and when you do this little computation, you end up with what is somewhat natural a Riccati type of equation. So in our Riccati equation, you have to go up and find it. That's the sort of end result. So there's some work here. So so it is very important that you have this graph, and unfortunately uh, for the uh, Gauss coverage equation, you don't don't have this graph because uh, you have this inequality called Onofre's inequality, which does not say that the graph bends. You should have to bend and cross the uh, uh, x-axis. That does not happen. Okay, so all right. So now I want to focus a little bit on the well-posedness of this problem. So as I said here, now, now the question is that there's a natural question that if you are below eight pi. Do you have global existence? Like for the Yamari problem, there is a paper of Kenig and Murd, which I talked about. And once, uh, and if you uh, if you want to get any anywhere, then you should get uh, lo at least local existence in the critical space H1. After that, you can start doing profile decomposition and all these things people are doing nowadays. But if you do not get a a existence in H1, you cannot do any of this stuff. There's no profile decomposition, no nothing. None of this kind of thing. You need to get started. Then, if you get started a little bit, then you can go forward. So, what is the best H HS space in which you can do anything? So, of course, there is a classical result of Cato, which basically is just a rough result that you have so any sort of nonlinearity you can do. You can get by with H2, and if you are a little bit H2 plus epsilon, you can get by. But that's not good. That's not good enough because you have to get down from there to H1 before you can get to do anything. And then you can understand all the concentration phenomena for these kinds of things. All right. So, uh, so, so basically, if you, uh, uh, so, 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 as, as I have said here, when initial data is bigger than two, then this is Cato's. Uh, old result from maybe 50 years ago, that uh, answer is yes, that if you are in HS, for S bigger than 2, you are going to have local existence. Not global, of course, but you will have local existence for any basic type of PD of this type. But to get down to anything geometric, you have to get down to H1, because that's the invariant space. That's dictated to you by all these dilations. Now, what is the difficulty? So the here, as I said, and I have repeatedly said, that the nonlinearity contains these first order terms. There is a very hidden cancellation here, which I'm going to tell you more about. So this will tell you these cancellations have to do with what are called null forms, which are very well known nowadays because of the work of Kleinerman and general relativity and so on. And that's exactly a type of null form. There are basically three types of null forms, and this one is one of the worst varieties. So 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 this. So, so there are firstly no good Strickard's estimates. So the only thing you have going for you are some energy estimates at this point and some utilization of some very nice cancellation that is taking place in this cross product. So that is the whole. So you can use this null structure. And so, uh, so as I said, there, there is a situation where you can actually go down to S equals 1 in 2 plus 1 dimensions. 
and that is when this this thing is exactly uh, of uh, uh, a harmonic map type. So it looks like this. Uh, it's, uh, so if you have seen the harmonic map equation, so the elliptic harmonic map equation, the elliptic harmonic map equation into the sphere is u mod gradu squared. This is the elliptic harmonic map equation. If you are valued in the sphere, and here, it, it, here it's going to be like u p e equals Laplacian of u, u equals of mod u p squared minus mod u squared. This will be the, the hyperbolic version. But this, this result is 100 pages long and is due to Terry Tau. So when you are down at two dimensions and when you are S equals one, this is like 100 pages and, and this is all work of Terry Tau. As soon as you go up in dimension, then there are, there are easier proofs of all of this by Shata and Michael Street. But in dimension, in dimension two, I mean, it's, these are very, very long papers. I mean, maybe three papers. And, together 200 pages by Terry Tau by himself. So, uh, uh, and that is for this sort of null form. This sort of null form here. And this sort of null form is a little bit easier than the null form that I, we, are, we are focused on, UX value. That's a little bit more complicated. Okay. So here, what, so here I've been uh, talking about these null structures and so on. So what are these null structures? So this is one type of, so here you see there's this Minkowski metric. So you're taking UV and this is the one that appears for wave maps. This is null form of type one. This is a null form of type two, which is the one we are looking at. You can see here that these are the terms in the cross product. And then you have the worst sort of null form of type three where the cross product also involves a time derivative. The null form of type two only involves cross product in the spatial derivative. So we are, we are focused on this one. So this is the one that appears in the wave maps and seems, it seems that this is a somewhat, somewhat simpler, I won't say uh, uh, very, very simple, but nevertheless there are immense uh, complications. And as you go down in dimensions to treat this one is harder and harder to see. So, as, as, so, so here, as I point out, T00 arises in the nonlinearity of the wave map equations which is now a focus of great interest by Terry Tau, Feynman, Schlag, Sturman, and lots of people. QIJ arises in the nonlinearity of the wave CMC, as we are saying. So why are these null forms better? Okay, why, why is it that these null forms are much better than just some random combination of derivatives and functions? As I said, if you try to really focus on wave equations with some random derivatives and so on, you're not going to go very far. In fact, your, the results you may get will be not much better than just uh, than Cato's result. If you want to get down to critical spaces and then do all this profile decomposition, these equations must come from some geometric problem. They must have cancellation, must have all of these things. They must, it must be natural. If, it, if you write down some sort of wave equation, which is uh, you put together stuff, I mean, it's, you're going to not have any interest in it. So anyhow, the null forms are actually better non-linearity. So in a sense, uh, when you try to look at it by looking at little baby or some sort of process like that, which is essentially the proofs that you apply, they somehow, um, they somehow the, the singularities get damped out in, in along the light cone directions in the dual variables. And I will explain this by, by, by a particular inequality, which I will write down in the second lecture. So if you the other day, I will write down what I mean. Why why are null forms better? This will become clear in the second lecture when I write down a particular inequality which is valid for this. Okay. So the the way that we are proceeding to to solve this <coughs> is a type of uh, wave overlap spaces that was invented by Jean Bourdain. So Burgan invented these Sobolev spaces, and they are proved to be extremely, it's an extremely powerful tool uh, to solve uh, these wave problems. And they have been later on uh, used by like Kleinerman and Makedon and Pataru and other people. And we are using these HSP spaces as the spaces in which we are going to find our solution. Okay, so what is this HSP space? So you have a function UTX. You say it is in HSP, okay? So, and I will explain to you why these spaces are better than just uh, Sobolev spaces or whatever. And you will see that, that there is a reason why, why these HSP spaces are, 
are, are somewhat nicer. Okay. So you take uh, in the in the space variable you take the HS dog, but along here along the light cone, the, the, the differentiation along the light cone is measured by this quantity. And this is just the Fourier transform of u, and then you are assuming that this is this integral is functional. So differentiation along the light cone is measured by this. Differentiation in space is being measured by s. And but, so s. Why is it not usual to tau squared minus psi squared? Is there any reason? But tau, tau plus psi is good, positive. Tau minus psi is the bad guy. So you just focus on that. So you see, if you have mod tau plus mod psi, it, it does not vanish. But mod tau minus mod psi does vanish, so that is the one that you get. That's the only reason. It, it really is. A, so it belongs to the S part, more or less. Yes, yes it belongs to the S part. So you, you don't really worry. It's, it's this part that is the trouble, troublemaker. Right? Because this can vanish, right? Okay. It's a space time Fourier transform. It's Fourier transform only in X variable. X anti. X anti. Yeah, tau is the dual variable between you. So I, I think Burgan used this for KDV type of issues. This is where he invented them, but then they are proved very successful. So uh, so we, we, we exploit this. Because we don't have strict hearts at these low dimensions. So this is the only thing that we have going for us at this point. At this point. OK, so now you have script HSB. Because we, so script HSB means u is in HSB, and the t derivative is in one lower, one lower uh, regularity. So this is what I mean by script HSB. And there, is a, there are many connections, which I'm, I'm going to talk in the second lecture. I will tell you more properties about these HSB spaces. I will like, explain to you a little bit more, tell you, make, familiarize you with some of the embedding theorems of HSP space. So, so S and B, as I am saying here, refer to differentiability in these two different directions. So what, what good are these things? Okay, we have this space, so what good are these? So, so the idea here is that, okay, you, you start out. So right now we are just focused on a, on a, a, a small time existence problem. And the global problem so far is out of reach. Okay? We don't even have H1 uh, existence, local existence in time in H1 data. So you cannot talk of anything global. You cannot talk of profile decomposition. None of this is in, is in our means. I mean, this is just right now in the future. Okay, so, so, you, so you want to set up some solution operator and then in these HSP spaces and so on, and then you want to apply some contraction mapping in these HSP spaces. This is the idea. This is how you get local existence. So the point is that you want to apply this contraction mapping for the correct S, which is S equals 1. I mean, that would be the best thing. So U0 there is in H1. U1 is in L2. This will be the correct space in which you are going to have initial data, the standards of other spaces. Your UXT will be in some appropriate HSB space. And then you apply some contraction mapping, if your t, your domain of the, uh, your time interval is, is small enough, you will get a contraction. And therefore, you will get a solution. And then you are going to blow up these solution slabs by using some global results like moser Tudinger or this Sobolev result, so on and so forth. You will see this happening for the Gauss equation, where the answer is a little bit better. OK, so, so the point here is that there is an inequality which says that if the Dalambertian, this is the real <coughs> equation. The Dalambertian, is, this is not box B, but this is Dalambertian. If you are in HS minus 1, B minus 1, then you sort of gain a little bit here. You see, there is a gain of some derivatives. Now, if you look at Strickhardt's estimate, there is no real gain in derivatives. It's a gain in LP spaces. There is a difference here. That is why HSB is preferable to a Strickhardt's estimate. Okay. So now let's say you plugged in for this, you plugged in your null form. Okay, so this is equal to your null form, whatever null form you have. Okay. So here you, you have your solution operator, here you have your initial conditions, and here is your null form plugged in. So the key point is can you control the HS minus 1, B minus 1 norm, say of this particular null form, in terms of the HSB norm of U? This is, this is the key. Okay, so if you can show you have this control, and this is usually extremely difficult. Okay, so so if you can do this with a slight uh, t to some epsilon power, there you will get, you will have your contraction <coughs> going for you, and you will be able to therefore get a fixed point, t. and that's where the work is. And this is not efficient because you. This, I'm not saying that 
this is doable all the time. I mean, there's a lot of hard work that we need to do here before you can establish. Okay, so so the the bad news here, as I have said here, that is that we are not in this. So here you can do something like this with this Q00 null form. Unfortunately, we are not dealing with Q00. We are dealing with this uh, the second the second second situation, and there in that second situation, this sort of thing is not quite. Simple. All right. So 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 as I said here that. Uh, so you, here you have, so I, as I pointed out before, that if you have this sort of inequality and you compare it with this one, which is a sort of Strickhart type of or energy inequality, you see here you have L1 in time and you have uh, something in space and look here, all you're gaining is L infinity in time and L, uh, L infinity in time and, and C1 in, in time here. So you're just gaining in LP spaces in time with a standard classical type of result. But here you're actually gaining some sort of derivatives. So therefore, you see why HSP space is preferable to this sort of energy or Strickhardt's estimate. Because of this gain, this long gain in the differentiation that you are seeing here. So this is the reason why it is preferable to work with HSP spaces than with some of these. So in this sort of thing, you actually see a gain along in the light form direction. It's a some sort of one derivative gain. Okay, so here's the existence theorem. It's not the best existence theorem, but it is there. We are half a derivative down. We have one half derivative there. So from two, we have brought it down to H three halves. If we are down to one, we are finished. That is the critical space. Then you can start asking all the questions of profile decomposition, bubbling, all the questions of which arise in conformal geometry, you can start asking in this, in this context. But we are not there yet, because this is the energy critical space. So this is what you get by classical things where there is no consideration given to the special cancellation of the right hand side. So here, S is bigger than three halves. By using the HSB technology, we have local in time existence. We have local performativeness of the CMC. So the half a derivative down, there is a good hope we can bring it down to five volts. But after that, I do not know what technology. I mean, it's. So P, P is good in this case, lowercase s minus one. P is bigger than one half all the time. That's because your s is bigger than three all the time. No, because there are other reasons why you will see in the next talk why it is preferable to keep B bigger than one half. The embedding theorems work better into the standard spaces when B is bigger than one half. It's not that you know, this H S cross H S minus one T is this H S S minus one. <coughs> yeah, this is the, the in, this is U naught and this is U one. This is the U naught. U naught is in here in H three halves plus epsilon. U one is in H one half plus epsilon. That's what I'm saying. You have two, right? Your data consists of two pieces. This has to be in H three halves plus epsilon. This has to be in H1 half plus H2. And you would like to make this in H1 and this in L2. Then you are energy critical. Once you're energy critical, you can start doing all the questions that you and Paul and others have been talking about in the elliptic conformal geometry. You can start asking all those questions, global existence and so on and so forth, below 8 pi, all of these things then can be asked. The global problems can be asked. If you do not know local in time existence, you cannot go to the global theory. They will be just abstract theories. And it will be, if you have local existence, then but do you have the local existence? You have to first answer that. You have none of those global questions. They are still in, so in the Yamabe case, of course, there's work. And in the wave map case and all this, there's, a, there's now huge amounts of work into the works of Terry Tao and Kleinerman, Kataru, Terry Miller. And so on. Here, the issues are low dimension and so on. It makes it really hard. Maybe you just pick the wrong problem. You should have started working higher. Okay, so as I said here, um, if you want to improve, push the in initial regularity down, then you may have, you, you may have to do something to your HSP space, work in a different space, which Kleinerman and his collaborators have, and Kataru, in, there are many papers in Jams and so on, by Kataru and Kleinerman and by Sturbrands and Marketo on this MKG and Young Mills. And they are looking at some subspaces of HSP, and in that they are working. And there they can they can do more. But I have not really focused uh, on, on, on those papers a lot because in the, the nature of this problem, this subject is such that the, 
the, the papers are very long all the time because there's a lot of technical details and so on. So it needs a lot of effort to just sit down and focus. But the hope is that at least one should be able, to, for some considerations, to push it down the pipeline. After that, I really see there are some, some issues that we have to confront to go below that. Okay, so there's also a scattering and dispersion that is associated with this, and one of the supposed speakers for this conference was Rupert Frank for many, uh, for many reasons, but he could not come here. And along with him, I have been able to show that you have some sort of dispersion effects for the linearized equation. I do not want to get into it. I will move on to the next one. So let's come to the main behavior equation. So, so, so here I have this parameter alpha, and as you very well know from the lectures of Alice, that the most important case is alpha equals one, because then you have a, the elliptic part, you have some problem. When alpha is less than one, you are sub-elliptic, or uh, sorry, below, below the critical value. So I'm going to focus on, on, on the sub-elliptic case first, and then talk about the situation, uh, not sub-elliptic, the sub-critical case first, and then talk of the critical case, the super critical case, and so on, in the second part. So in here, you do have local well posedness for any alpha. Doesn't matter what alpha is. Less than one, bigger than one, so on. You can always solve for u naught. So you take your u1, uh, there is some, some normalization you have to put in here, that its integral is zero. And then for u naught in h1 of s2, and u1 in l2 of s2, you can always solve in, in, in the u being in h1 in space and continuous in time and intersection. u t will be uh, uh, c0 and is empty. So if you look at, uh, you will always get a solution u of xt on the sphere and with, with uh, this Cauchy data. This is always true. So the local existence is taken care of. So now you have to ask yourself what happens globally. Do your solutions live for all time and so on and so forth? And there you start to now see Moser, Krudinger and all of these things we talked about, they are needed. Okay, so uh, well, so the, the, the basic fact that we are using for the local existence is basically the Duhamel principle and then once you use that, then there is some, some machine that you have to employ and then you get this way. Now, what is also important now, you have already seen this part here. So there is a, there is a U part, but that's not there. Yet. But you already are seeing this, this sort of energy thing come up for the elliptic case. And this is the conserved quantity. This is the conserved quantity along the flow where U bar, U bar is this. So if you use this thing, which is conserved, right? So what is going to happen? That if alpha is less than one, you have a coercivity. Moser Trudinger tells me I have coercivity. This is conserved, this is constant. So if you have coercivity, you have control of what drag you sweat. So if you go further in time, this will always remain controlled if alpha is less than one. Therefore, you will have global existence when alpha is less than one. Because exactly you're seeing here that this is very typical. If you have to get local existence. Once you have local existence, then ideas from elliptic theory <coughs> do play a role even though you are in a hyperbolic problem. You cannot just say, oh, this is hyperbolic, I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore it. No, it, it, the elliptic theory is needed for the global aspect. That is fundamental because it has to do with bubbling and concentration and so on. So when alpha is less than one, you have uh, existence for all time. This is, this is a theory. So the question then comes, what happens when alpha equals one? What happens when alpha is bigger than one? Okay, and as you can see here, that when alpha is one, you see, this thing is related to an offering. So the energy can all can never become negative. It's always bigger equal to zero. So that graph that you saw for the C and C never crosses the x-axis. It will always be above the x-axis. So that trick that I showed you to get blow up cannot be used for this problem. This is a sad thing. Okay, so here this is uh, something that I have put in here, but you have already seen this. So this, uh, there is this famous number 4 pi and so on and so forth. And, uh, you, and so I'm just recalling for you what is the Mozart shooting by inequality, and then, and then we're just going to tell you the idea. So this is what Alice has already proved. Okay, so the idea here is that you have 
uh, you have this estimate, you have a bound, and then as I'm saying here, you have the result of one off three that this thing can be treated to be zero. And once 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 you have that result, then as I said here, that if alpha is less than one, then you can uh, control since you have energy conservation, you can control this lower bound this by this quantity. This quantity is now under control. This quantity is now under control because that's obvious. This is not negative anyhow. And therefore, you're playing these two off. And so now, therefore, you come to a finite time. You have a solution. But at that point, you have control on this. So you can go forward, keep going forward in time. You have existing solid. So you see here that if you want to do global, you first have to end up in, by an existence theorem in the correct space to apply all this Onofre and uh, this Moser, Tudinger, and so on. If you are going to get existence in the wrong space, local in time, you will not be able to apply something like Moser. So that the energy critical space is the space where you have to work yourself in. Otherwise, you are, you, there is no theory, no global theory. OK, so Moser also, as uh, Alice also remarked, that if your functions are even on S2, then you can improve this constant to k five. And so, the, so in other words, uh, in our result, uh, if the u0 and u1 are even functions, then this alpha that you had, you can also make it less than two. So if your initial data is, uh, is, is the same at antipodal points, that is, you have an even function, then you can even go beyond one, and you can go all the way to two. So the question then is, what if I don't have this condition of evenness, and alpha is one, when you're exactly the elliptic <coughs> Exactly conformal. What happens? That is the main, main question, right? Okay. So before I address that question, I just want to point out that there are there are all these uh, nonlinear systems of this type. So the Moser uh, the, the, so the Gauss curvature equation that we saw is 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 a scalar equation. But you can also look at uh, you can look at equations of this type, which are system versions of the Gauss curvature equation. And I think uh, uh, these were first, uh, at least in my knowledge, at least questions about symmetry and so on were studied in a paper with, uh, with my collaborator and my colleague, Michael Kissel. So we were, we were looking at these equations, and then we have a, we have a parallel result like Tom and Lee and, uh, and, uh, and Chen, uh, that we, that which Alice talked about, about rotational symmetry and so on. And this system. Uh, some people call it Toda system or whatever has become uh, very, very popular nowadays after our paper in works of Chang Shaolin and his collaborator Zhu Chenwei and Shafri Wolanski and so many of them. So I just want to point out that whatever I just said now is also applicable to, to global systems of this type. So the existence of our systems. So, uh, okay. So now uh, I want to talk about alpha equals one. And to talk about alpha equal one, I will be using a concentration theorem of Paul and Alice. So this concentration theorem that they have in their ARCA paper and in their JDT paper is very useful. So you may think, oh, this is an elliptic problem, a hyperbolic problem. It has nothing to do with the elliptic problem. No, as I said, when you start to do the global theory, you better keep the elliptic thing in your mind. If you don't, then, 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 you, then you cannot just be a hyperbolic person and just say, uh, you know, I, I don't want to look at all the elliptic case. You're not going to make any progress. You may make some progress in the local existence, but you're going to, because it's geometric. So you're going to hit difficulties if you do not keep in mind also what is happening in the elliptic case. So let me explain some, some language here, which is uh, uh, explained very well in, in the papers of Paul and Alice, and that is now the notion of center of mass. And this, I think, even goes back earlier, if I'm not mistaken, to Oban. So Oban was the one who, in a famous paper in uh, Journal of Functional Analysis, introduced this notion of center of mass. So the center of mass of a, of a function is this, this ratio. And the point here is that notice that this center of mass is uh, less equal to 1. That's why we didn't have to find it. And what, what, is, what is the key point of Oban? So the Oban's uh, point is that if the center of mass of a function stays inside the sphere, strictly inside the sphere, you have an improvement in the moser schrodinger inequality. That constant 4 pi can be taken more. And you can see that in Moser's own result. Because for an even function, so if you have an even function, the center of mass is 0. So therefore, you do have an improvement in this constant. This, constant, this, this number here, this number here can be improved. So here, if the standard Moser-Trudinger is with 1, 
But if you are going to have the center of mass inside, like here, then you can take it to be some number between one half and one, strictly less than one. So you have you get an improvement in, in this inequality as soon as the center of mass of the function stays inside this field. So this is a fundamental observation of, of, of Oban. And then this has been exploited in a very nice way by, by Paul and Alex. So this is our blow up criterion. So when alpha, so I'm not saying this blow up when alpha equals one. Okay. So I'm not saying that you have a blow up when alpha equals one. I'm saying if there is a blow up, then this is what you're going to see. This is the nature of the blow up on the sphere for that equation. So your center of mass has to go to one. In, 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 because if it doesn't go to one, it is less than one, then you are going to get an improvement in your moser tudinger inequality. You can continue the solution beyond the blow up time. So this must happen at the blow up time. Then uh, this, this also has to happen. And the moser tudinger inequality basically will tell me that if this happens, then this has to happen. Because this is dominated below by this quantity. So this goes to infinity you can use it. And so moreover, what does happen is that you see, if you look at, uh, so here there is a, so there's a, <coughs> so this quantity here that you have here, you see, you look at this, this is the integration on a tiny ball, and this is the integration on the full sphere. This ratio is becoming bigger than one minus epsilon. So what essentially this is saying is that this quantity here is going to a Dirac mass. So you have a one point blow up. This is what is happening. So which is normally what you end up with a single Dirac mass on the sphere is what you end up when you fail Palais mail or any of these compactness, loss of compactness and so on, <coughs> which has occurred in the work of Paul Ellis on describing Gauss curvature. So you get exactly one point block. And the one point block is to be naively understood that if you have, let's say, another way to think of one point blow up is let's say you blow up at two points. So you blow up at two points. Then the center of mass is going to lie inside. And if the center of mass lies inside, then you can just push forward. So you have to have basically one point blow up. There's no, that, that's a naive way to think of why you expect on S2 in the Gauss curvature problem, only blow up at one single point of e to the 2u is e to the 2u going to the Dirac mass at a single point. Why should that happen? Because if you have blow up at several points, it will push the center of mass inside, and then you will get an improvement by looking at four points. So that so that's the same phenomena is happening in the case of the wave equation. That is, if you blow up, I'm not saying you will blow up when alpha is one. If you blow up, you just blow up at one point. Okay. So, so, so this is essentially what I, the content of this result is. So. Here, yeah, so, so, you, so if this, you see, why is this infinite? So the reason that this is infinite is if you remember that we had, uh, we had a conservation of energy. So in the conservation of energy, this was a minus log term. So the energy is conserved. So if this guy is finite, then mod drag u squared is going to be finite. And then you can keep forward, going forward in time. So this, better, this thing better become infinite. Otherwise, if you apply conservation of energy, you have control on mod drag u square again. That's because you can drop this term in this point. So, so the, the finiteness of this will, the infiniteness of this will force the infiniteness of mod drag u square. And then this is put into play in the in the, uh, the paper of uh, the lemma of concentration lemma of, uh, of Alice and Paul because they have a they have a alternative. And so here is the here is their lemma. So their lemma. Their lemma, their concentration lemma, in, the, in their work on Gauss curvature, says that if you have a sequence like this with this condition, then you either have this being finite, or there is a point where this happens. <coughs> so, in a sense, what I'm saying is that this does not happen for us. This is infinite because uh, if it is finite, then you can keep going forward. This is a blow of time, so you're forced into this alternative. So, this is this is a lemma with an alternative. So you are either this alternative or this alternative. And this alternative is ruled out. So therefore, you are forced into this Dirac mass situation. Okay, so there is some, some, some work here that you, you so I, I, I want to spare you the details of this. But there is a, some amount of work that is needed to use our work and then put it into the situation of framework of the lemma. And once you are in the framework of that lemma, you can do this. But it is a question as to how, whether you actually have a blow up, and the reason that we cannot do 
that, uh, the, that there is a finite time blow up when alpha equals one is exactly because that graph, that, that graph that I wrote down for you, right, for the CMC is, 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 is like this here. So it looks like this here because of Onofri. Onofri says you cannot, it doesn't bend. But for CMC, it bent and came down. So that is why we would play this game. For the Yamabe, it also bends and comes down. So that is why Kenny and Merle would play the game. So if you have a graph like that, which happens for the gauss gauss equation because of Onofri's inequality, you see the Onofri's inequality basically means that mod grad u squared plus minus log whatever is bigger equal to zero. That tells you that the graph doesn't bend, and so you cannot cannot apply the same argument that I showed you for this case. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so, so here are some questions. So. Do you have global existence for the scalar wave Liouville when in the critical phase? Okay. So if you don't, then can you exhibit a finite time blow up? But, and if you have a finite time blow up, then you know exactly what the blow up is by what I have just presented. All right. So when when alpha is one, okay, there is as I pointed out to you that there is no initial data of negative energy because this is an Offrey's uh, an Offrey's theorem, which is. Uh, you know, he, he was answering a question of Moser, and Moser wanted to know what is the lower bound of that, and on office proof that it is zero. And at zero, it is exactly uh, this, uh, the, 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 it's a log of the determinant of a conformal transformations of the sphere. That is exactly what happens when, you are, when the, the energy is zero. So uh, we tried to do some ODE analysis or something, but uh, it was inconclusive, so we could not we could not conclude whether there is or there is not a block. And we also try to do numerical things uh, because there is a person in, in Poland who is very famous in, in all of these uh, hyperbolic problems, a physicist by the name of Bison, who generates lots of, uh, lots of uh, conjectures which then eventually all turn out to be true by work of uh, Kleinerman and not Kleinerman, but Terry Tau and Schlag. But he also found that he he, 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 could, he ran some programs, but they were still incomplete. So I don't think that. So there's, there's no numerical evidence for or against blow up. All right. So, um, so I just want to say a few words here. There, so there are, uh, there are these uh, type, types of blow ups you can have that, that they do have uh, blow ups where this is infinite, which is what. Uh, and you also have blow ups where this happens. And this type one, type two language is, I think, due to Zapier's Kenny Mel and Krieger Schlaf. <coughs> and so they have this profile decomposition for Yamabe problems this, for this equation. Okay. So they have this profile decomposition here for this type two radiant blow ups and so on. We are, we are nowhere near doing any of this <coughs> for CMC or any of this. Okay. So at least uh, we, are, we are in this. Case, sorry, so. Okay, so we are in this case. Remember, this this gradient thing became infinite. So one one uh, one uh, one hope would be to see whether you have type one type of blow up for this Liouville equation when alpha equals one. And it seems to me that you have to understand this quantity when that when the Onofri energy, namely this, is somehow What do you do? So I think I, I just want to stop here because uh, uh, I, the next part uh, is going to be a little bit more technical. I don't want to say too much about it. So the next class, uh, I will try to prove for you a Strickhardt's import because this is something I did not do in the workshop. I want to show you exactly how does one prove a Strickhardt's inequality and then tell you a little bit about the HSB species. Uh, give you some uh, some of the embedding uh, results. Tell you, tell you a little bit about exactly what we need uh, to, to um, what we what was used in, in proving our results, and also tell you how how uh, uh, the null form comes into play and how you decompose the null form into certain objects that then allow you to apply the system So this is a, this is some technical aspect that I do not want. To so what happened?
happens uh, uh, what happens in uh, proxy two? Yeah, you get for alpha less than two. You have global x. Yes, I, I, that was a theorem. So when uh, when you are an uh, when you are an RP two, <coughs> then you can take alpha to be less than two. So there you will have global existence of the back equation. But when you do not have that condition, then when alpha is one, that is where you will be. But I know that you have one point blow up if there is a blow up. You will only blow up in one point. But whether you really have that blow up, I don't know because uh, you see, you saw the argument. You have, if it bent down, you can play some game. But since it does not go down by an offering, you cannot you cannot use that argument that I that I wrote down by trying to take the L2 norm and then trying to get some sort of Descartes condition, uh, uh, ODE inequality, and making these blow up. It doesn't work. So we tried, you know, Polam and try I tried a lot. We asked Bison, and Bison also to try it, I think, I suppose, and he told us that it is inconclusive. He yeah. didn't see anything happen. But if you start out with initial data. Yeah, for that, any alpha will work. For mm -hmm. local in time. It's a slightly change. So initial data is more perturbation of even function. Ah. What happened? <laughs> so, so you cannot you, use that in the form, right? No. So you will get local existence for sure. That, that does not depend on the value of alpha. So then, uh, yeah, then I don't know. So you're perturbing the even function a bit. Yes. So what is the result in the case of uh, the standard? Uh, is there something? You always have resistance. No, because uh, the center of mass is uh, not moved at all. Ah, then, then, then you then you seem okay. Then it would, if the center of mass is not going to move, but how do you know the dynamics of the center of mass? You don't know the dynamics. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could, it could start away, but uh, then start to evolve, and the, the dynamics could start to head into the on the boundary on the surface of the sphere. Then you die. Usually that happens, but if the center of mass originally is already close to zero, yeah. how does that happen also? Yeah, so so I try to write down the dynamics. So I try to write down the dynamics. Okay. That's exactly what this means. But it's that's not clear. Not clear. Not clear. I mean I wanted an equation that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to write down what is the dynamics of the center of mass as as time evolves. And it's not it's not clear at all exactly what is really happening. I mean the the behavior could in principle be very complicated. The question is whether it hits the sphere in finite time or whether it hits the sphere in infinite time. It could blow up at infinite time too. And there's no reason why it should blow up at finite time. It could just take its own time and hit at infinity. And then you will have a blow up at infinity. Here I'm saying that you will have uh, at infinity your mod grad u square is controlled. It could uh, you could have all sorts of complicated things. <coughs> so here at least you can there is a notion that okay you settle this you have profile some profile decomposition you're already seen here by this one point go up. But in the CMC you are not at H one so you cannot use uh, the vente inequality any of this so you would start to start to use these ideas. Once you are with your short time existence, then you can start to take the elliptic type ideas and you know concentration ideas like you and uh, and uh, Rick Shane and so on, and then try to understand the uh, least Try to understand the global global existence. But we're not there yet. We are H three halves. So I want to say a little bit about how we do it. It's already already missing. So we, 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 I think if you try using some little bit daily and so on, maybe we push it to my phone. We have some ideas, but uh, you know, you ran away. <laughs> Eventually, you know, these things take time. Two years, three years, four years. We get there. So about the dynamics, about the set of Yes. So what do you think? You think that if the solution blow out, then it will. The, the center of mass of the whole 
Yeah, yeah if, 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 if it blows up, then we have a theorem. The center of mass has to go to work. It has to. So, so, but what I think is happening is that inside the sphere, there could be some very complicated dynamics of this. And what is it going to do? It could hit it at any time. I don't know. 